welcome to Arkansas Wildlife. It's all about fishing on this week's show, starting with a trip to the Andrew Holsey State Fish Hatchery near Hot Springs. When it comes to bass fishing, one of the most desirable types of fish is the Florida strain largemouth bass. And this week, we're gonna show you how the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is producing more Florida strain bass to be stocked in Arkansas waterways. From there, we're headed to Lake Atkins, where Florida strain largemouth bass have been stocked for about 20 years since a total overhaul of the lake in the early 2000s. And finally, we're gonna look into catch and release fishing and fisheries management and show you how, while catch and release has been a very popular and important way to protect fisheries over the years, it's not always the answer. And keeping a few fish, in some cases, can actually do good for the long-term health of a fishery. All that and this week's winner of an Arkansas hunting and fishing license right after this break. Arkansas Wildlife is brought to you in part by Academy Sports and Outdoors. For all, for less. For the avid bass fishermen, there's nothing quite like catching a trophy largemouth. But some of the big bass swimming in Arkansas waters aren't native to the state. Some are actually Florida strain largemouth bass, and the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission breeds them at the Andrew Hulsey State Fish Hatchery near Hot Springs, using a technique called mat spawning. Uh, we've been raising Florida bass here since the early 90s. Uh, historically, we've wild spawned the Florida bass in our ponds where we just paired them up and let nature take its course. Uh, it works really well, uh, however, in the last nine years we've been uh, trying out new methods of spawning and we've uh, developed what we call a caged uh, raceway or caged mat spawning technique uh, that's exclusive here at our hatchery. Other hatcheries across the states use uh, raceways to mat spawn bass in. Unfortunately, we don't have a raceway, so what we've done is we've created an elongated cage inside the pond on a concrete pad where we will uh, mat spawn our Florida bass. And uh, the last five years, it's been working really well. The first brood, Florida brood here at Andrew Holsey came from Florida. And uh, I think a few years later, they got some from Texas. And once we got established and maintained our own Floridas here at the hatchery, then we just keep we keep some fingerlings year, you know, each year back to use as future brood. When these fish re reach two years old, we actually do genetic testing to ensure that we do have Florida bass that you know on site, and the ones that come back positive as Floridas, we'll uh, tag those fish with a orange elastomer tag under their dorsal fin, and those are the ones that we use in our fish production. So, what's so special about these Florida strain bass? Well, under the right conditions, these fish grow faster and reach a larger maximum size than our native northern strain largemouth. By stocking Florida bass in suitable lakes, the Game and Fish Commission is trying to increase trophy bass potential for the state's anglers. When we started doing this nine years ago, we would take a pair of bass and put them in individual pens and allow them to spawn naturally, uh, and then we would replace those fish you know, with a new fresh pair of bass and new mat and allow them to spawn. And it did work. The problem being is that some fish wouldn't spawn in the time they were in the cage and you'd always end up with some left over after the project that never even got the opportunity to spawn. So uh, what's really great about the way we do it now in the spawning cage is that they, all the fish have the opportunity to spawn. We have those fish segregated in the pond originally and we'll pull the divider, we'll place the the spawning mats in the cage. We place them about every three or four feet uh, along the cage. The cage is measured 150 feet long by seven feet wide. And uh, then we'll check them daily, you know. And usually when we pull, when it gets right and we pull that divider, the very next day we're picking up spawns. And once we get them indoors, uh, we actually, we bring them in, we treat these eggs uh, with a disinfectant, you know, for fungus and, and bacterial things like that and then we will slowly warm the water up to 72 degrees. At 72 degrees, the eggs will hatch in two days. And once they hatch out, those fry will fall to the bottom of the vat. Those fry will stay in that vat for about seven days until they become swim-up fry. 
uh, when they're first hatched, they have a, a large yolk sac that keeps them weighted to the bottom and they're transparent. And as they get older, they'll take on color and they'll absorb that yolk sac and they'll swim up to the top of the water column. At that time, we call them swim up fry and that's when we'll harvest them to take them to the ponds. Initially, we'll stock these ponds at 100,000 fry per acre and then you know, we'll sample them each week to ensure that the, the fry are growing. Um, the greatest benefit opposed to wild spawn is that uh, you don't have a size variance in these fish the way that we're doing it and so you don't get cannibalism in your pond and that creates a larger yield or more production in each pond. Another benefit is that you know with wild spawning you're looking to create a million you know fingerlings uh, for a production year you're looking at using you know 32 acres of pond space uh, and six to eight hundred broodfish uh, to get that and so with mat spawning you know it's a benefit because we're, we're using 130 fish and probably you know 18 to 20 acres and so that allows us uh, more space to raise other things. Uh, we will you know take the crew out we have long seines about 150 feet long and we'll pull those seines drain the ponds down pull the seines through the pond and actually you know net those fish up in the seine and then we are able to you know grab them out Care, put them in butt buckets and put them onto the transport truck. After these fingerling bass are loaded, it's off to stock them in Arkansas lakes that are conducive to Florida bass survival. One of those lakes is Lake Atkins, where these fish have been thriving for more than a decade. After the break, we're headed there to try to catch a trophy largemouth. We're setting out on Lake Atkins on a warm spring morning. Lake Atkins is an Arkansas game and fish owned lake just south of Atkins and it's quickly developing a reputation for producing trophy largemouth bass. It didn't take us long to find out why. About 30 minutes to be exact. Come over that log. And that one. <laughs> Yes, sir. There we go. <laughs> Number one. Look at that. Tell me he didn't like that frog. <laughs> nice Atkins. Large mouth with likely some Florida bass jeans. Lake Atkins isn't a very big lake, just less than a thousand acres total, and it presents some unique challenges for anglers in search of its trophy bass. We're throwing a, this is actually a spro, but a hollow bodied uh, plastic frog, and throwing it as far back under these cypress trees as you can. Of course, it's, they're leafed out, it's green right now, so you gotta get under there, skip it under sometimes and uh, just get it as far back as you can because these fish are laying back there, it's shaded, uh, a lot of overhead cover, a lot of protection, a lot of stuff in the water to uh, cover for them. This is a prime example of what I'm talking about. I can't even see my bait when it gets back up in there. And you do end up doing a little bit of backlash and trying to skip this 50 pound braid but I can't even see the bait. Well, I kind of got to peek through the trees to see it sometimes. But this braid is critical to the equation as well. 
saw with that one fish, I mean, if he, you've got to pull him over multiple cypress knees and logs and bushes and it doesn't, uh, it's not, not just pulling it smooth through the water at all. They're like fishing fly line. Lake Atkins is less than a thousand acres, so it doesn't get like a lot of bass tournaments and things like that. You can't run boats out here like you can on our big core lakes, but if you want a chance to catch a truly, you know, trophy fish, it's one of the best places in Arkansas to go right now. Part of the reason the lake produces such big bass is because uh, we essentially got a new start with it. Game and Fish came in, killed out all the rough fish, uh, refilled the lake, put some, some habitat in here, some brush piles and things like that, and then restocked it with sport fish and restocked it with 100% Florida strain largemouth bass. This is about as far north as you'll find Florida strain bass. Um, so uh, now it's not pure Florida strain anymore. I mean, people put fish in here. You've got some feeder creeks, and so you've got northern and Florida hybrids, but there's still strong Florida genes in the, in the gene pool of the largemouth here. And, uh, and this lake, I mean, year after year, produces you know 10, 11, 12 pound fish. The question remained, would we be able to catch one of these big bass? After four hours throwing the frog, it was time for a change. I've been throwing that frog all day and Scotty in the back of the boat's been trying some different stuff, but man, besides that one fish this morning, really not much. So I'm gonna try some drop baits now. I've been throwing a Cinco a little bit and try this red uh, zoom, red shad zoom brush hog, see what we can do with it. Yeah, it's a good one. If this is a bass, it's huge. It's gotta be a catfish. No, oh my God. Oh my God, this may be the biggest bass I've ever caught. what Lake Atkins is all about right there. Oh my God. Oh. Oh. Oh my God. Oh. Oh, I kind of thought it was a catfish because he is a giant. Wow. That is a pig. I'm going to get a drink of water. Where's the scale? Oh, little seat. Six point eight five, almost seven. Wow! Look at that. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Man, that was incredible. So I threw in on that dock. Uh, just off the dock on that brush pile, about like my first or second cast there, pitched in there, and I went to lift up to try to, you know, catch, feel my weight, and there was nothing there. And I looked, and the line was just swimming off. It had like gone 15 feet. So I set the hook, and man, I was sure that was a catfish at first because I, I mean, the, the fish got me underneath the boat, and I couldn't get him up, and oh, man. That's why you do this, for fish like that. That's the great thing about fishing. You can be having a slow day that looks like a bust, and then, in an instant, hook into a fish that creates a lifetime memory and a great fishing story. You never know what can happen on that next cast. By the way, we tested our scale against a certified scale back at the office, and it was weighing a little light. Taking that into account, the fish turned out to be seven pounds, two ounces. After a catch like that, the only thing left to do is hit the Lucky Landing Bait Shop for one of their famous cheeseburgers to close out the day. No 
noted conservationist and fly fisherman Lee Wolf mapped out the principles of catch and release fishing in his book, The Handbook of Freshwater Fishing. He's often credited as the godfather of catch and release fishing in the United States. The catch and release movement is one of the most successful conservation campaigns ever. In fact, it's been too successful. You know, it's, it's uh, our, a lot of our management uh, strategies over the years have been based on an assumption that fish are harvested. And they're just, when it comes to bass, black bass, they're just not. I mean, we, we do creel surveys around the state and we measure, you know, percentage of fish that are caught, that are kept. And it's just, it's extremely low all over the place. When anglers don't keep enough fish from a body of water, sometimes there's not enough food to sustain a robust population of fish of various sizes. In an acre of water, there's only going to be a certain pound, number of pounds per acre of fish. And it can either be a whole lot of small fish or a few large fish or something in between. And getting those small fish out of there allows the remaining ones to grow faster, grow larger. Historically, when we've tried to produce trophy bass, we put slot limits on, high slot limits oftentimes, 16 inches to 21 inches. Uh, with the theory being if, we get, if people would harvest a lot of fish under 16 inches, that those fish over 16 inches would grow through that slot really quickly. Well, unfortunately, that just hasn't worked because the harvest never has been high enough under the slot. There are some exceptions. Our streams, they don't need harvest. Smallmouth bass, uh, they don't successfully reproduce necessarily every year. It, it's highly dependent on stream flows during a very short window of time when they're spawning. They get a big flood that comes through during the spawn. Well, there's just no smallmouth spawn that year. You know, the Arkansas River is another place that uh, is, we have a minimum length limit there because we don't want small fish kept from the Arkansas River. We want to protect those fish because that's another system where we don't necessarily get a successful spawn every year because of flooding, because of uh, the habitat degradation that's happened over time where the backwaters have silted in. So we don't need that on the Arkansas River. We don't need it on streams, but reservoirs, I mean, you, you take your pick of Arkansas reservoirs, large or small, and almost all of them could use more bass harvest. Trout anglers led the charge for catch and release fishing. And for the most part, it has provided positive results. An exception is the brown trout population on the Little Red River. Trout anglers actually were doing it before the bass anglers. They, they started the catch and release ethic and the bass anglers learned from them. And it, so it's been going on a long time. And for a lot of our trout waters in Arkansas, it hasn't hurt too bad because there's only, the, fi the only fish in there are the ones we put there. However, at the, in the Little Red River, we have a naturally spawning population of brown trout. And it, it's gotten overpopulated and there are just tons and tons of small brown trout in there. And if you wonder why they're not getting large, it's not because there aren't a lot of them there, it's because there are too many of them there. And they're competing for limited resources in an infertile tailwater there. And if we're ever gonna see the growth of brown trout on the Little Red get back to any semblance of what it was decades ago, we're gonna have to have some anglers keep some of those brown trout because they do spawn like crazy in that river. To be clear, fisheries managers aren't asking anglers to keep every fish they catch, but keeping some of the smaller legal fish from a particular body of water can sometimes serve the greater good. I mean, we're not asking anybody to throw a five pounder in the live well and take it home and and fry it. We're, we're just, we're talking about the small fish, less than two pounds. Those are the ones, those are the most numerous fish in any lake, uh, are the ones that are under two pounds. So take those home, cook those, they're the best tasting fish, they're the most abundant fish, uh, those are the ones you want to keep. Make it a priority. Really think about it and think about what effect it's going to have on the fishery uh, now and into the future. Regulations can only go so far. So it will take collaboration between biologists and anglers to help improve the natural state's fisheries. Biologists don't manage fisheries in a vacuum. The anglers are an important component and we need anglers to harvest fish if we want to all see the, the type of success we want to see with the larger fish. And if we could really get a critical mass of anglers to shift their thinking that way, we could really see a difference in in our size structure, improving our size structure of our bass in Arkansas. 
Arkansas Wildlife presents the Watch and Win Giveaway. During each episode of Arkansas Wildlife, we'll give away an Arkansas resident hunting and fishing license. At the end of this season, we'll be giving away $500 worth of fishing gear with everything you need for outdoor adventures on Arkansas lakes and streams. It's all provided by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Visit the Arkansas Wildlife webpage at arkansaswildlife.com and click on the watch and win icon to enter. This week's winner is Chuck McDaniel from Little Rock. Congratulations and thanks for watching.